Okay, everybody, how's, uh, how's the day been for you so far? A bunch of guys that have done a lot of that work are in this room now, right now, uh, in addition to all the great volunteers and putting a conference on is difficult. Actually, aha, four conspirators are here. So, Mike, Dallas, Eric, you guys want to stand up, please? Work, but um, you know the co-conspirators that, that do all the things late at night, including uh, you know putting people up in places and carrying out the garbage and whatever else is necessary. Those are critical. So uh, thanks, you guys. Um, also, uh, we're being hosted by CERN. You guys are probably aware, and this facility is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I want to break everything in it, but I'm not touching anything. <laughs> um, but Kevin is here. I want to make a couple of public service announcements, but I'd like to thank Cerner for allowing a bunch of you know, security professionals to uh, take over the day for on a Saturday in a place that is still pretty new, obviously, so and contributing to the community that way. So thank you. All right, so uh, I have the pleasure of announcing, I don't know if it was announced before, but uh, at the end of today, there's gonna be um, alcohol downstairs for everyone, which is yay! yay. <laughs> okay, and now, uh, also exciting announcement, so, but important too. We want everyone to be responsible and safe, and so if anyone uh, doesn't feel like uh, that they feel comfortable driving afterwards, um, you can leave your car here. Um, in order to do that, though, you need to fill out a flyer that is at the desk um, uh, in the event space, like the, the event support desk that is near the restrooms. Um, you can get a flyer there and fill out basically a liability waiver. Um, we want you to take advantage of that if you need it. Um, what we would rather you not do, though, is uh, take advantage of it if you are not drinking and you just want to like leave your car here to go someplace else tonight and pick it up tomorrow. The reason being is that it's gonna be a hassle to pick up your car tomorrow, because while the gates were open today and you were able to come through Santa with B-sides, tomorrow they're like, B-sides was yesterday, what are you doing here? And security will have to escort you individually to your cars and stuff, so take advantage of it. Um, if you need it, we really want you to be responsible tonight. Otherwise, uh, uh, have fun and thanks for being here. <laughs> So basically, there's no way to get away from the walk of shame. That's happening. <laughs> no, it is. At least it's a safe walk of shame. Um, so, uh, I would love to introduce somebody that I'm excited to watch this presentation. There's a lot of interesting things. I have a daughter uh, who's 14. Uh, she knows all the wrong things about the cybersecurity industry, and she's not into STEM at all. Um, but she's learned how to write Python and a whole host of other things, and she knows all of my stories. Um, so, it's really interesting and important to me when somebody has taken the time and the benefit of the energy of the community to foster them and bring them along to a place where they're ready to present and talk about that in a way that's compelling for other young girls and other women as well as the rest of us that need to pay attention to these things when we're thinking about recruiting. So I'd love to introduce Ruby Rios. Technology, 
The number of females studying computer science has mostly declined since about 1984. And since in 2017, only 26% of professional computing occupations in the U.S. were held by women. Now, there are a few theories as to why this happened in the 1980s. For one thing, this was around the time that the microcomputers began replacing the giant IBM mainframe computers. The photo on your left shows the first 11 employees at Microsoft. And while, yes, two of them are female, one of them was the documentation writer, and the other was a bookkeeper. Another thing that has happened that happened in the 1980s was the beginning of video gamer culture. These games were heavily marketed towards boys. And then movies of the 1980s started to reinforce this new stereotype of computer nerds as socially inept boys giving us movie characters like these. And just like several decades ago with doctors, there are currently people who believe that men are simply better suited than, than women to work in tech. Last year's infamous Google memo literally said that. And for females who are currently working in or studying in this field, many are having to deal with not being taken seriously, with being overlooked for leadership roles, and even worse, with forms of harassment. Clearly, this industry needs to improve. So these stereotypes and these issues have had an effect on females interested in computing. And it's led to this. Girls in elementary school show a strong interest in studying computing. But nearly all of them lose this interest by the time they reach college. By that point, they become convinced that this field is not for them. The good news is that there are a lot of people and organizations that are working to turn the tide. These include Girls Who Code, which offers summer immersion programs and after school programs for girls in the 6th through 12th grades. The National Center for Women in Information Technology, which offers awards both at the high school and collegiate levels for girls with an interest in computing. And Kansas City's own Girls in Tech KC movement, which offers camps and other opportunities for girls right here in Kansas City. Even the Girl Scouts of America is working towards resolving this. They've introduced 23 new STEM-related merit badges last year, including some badges in cybersecurity. With all the attention being given to it, it might be tempting to think that the Girls in Tech issue is being solved. And in some ways, it is. The movement to bring more girls in tech technology has gained a lot of traction. And there have been some success stories. Girls Who Code's annual report, released this month, said that we are on track to achieve gender parity in STEM by 2027. And for the third year in a row, Kansas City was rated by personal finance company Smart Asset as the number two city for women in tech to work. But working towards a solution and having the problem solved are two different things. We need to be cognizant of the girls in tech problem every day and work every day to solve it. Well, I'm not suggesting that we all go and volunteer at a Girls in STEM organization every day. There are things that we can do to help. And that's what I'd like to talk to you about today. First, let's try to put this issue in perspective. From one point of view, it could be argued that women in tech aren't as bad off as women in other fields. While our numbers are low, women in tech have a relatively lucrative career. And it could be argued that we don't face as many challenges in women in industries such as the entertainment industry and the military, to just name a couple. But on the other hand, technology is literally about leading society towards a better future. So why can't our industry be leading all other industries when it comes to diversity in our workplace? Why can't our tech teams be the model for other industries to follow instead of the boys club model? Before we go any further, I'd like to hear from a few of you. Why do you think it's important to bring more women into technology? I'll take about three responses. Yep. Um, so I would say one of the general things is that, I mean, in a society where there is not effectively already perfect gender equality, um, I think having people who have a different set of life experiences because of their gender bring new and unique ideas that a group of people who have similar life experiences like might not have thought of. We had a great speaker, uh, oh, never mind, I don't remember the name. Kurt, Carter, Terry, someone here knows what I'm talking about. Who? Karen Caitlin. I think so, yeah. Um, who, she was saying things, I was like, <coughs> you know, like, I never even thought of it that way. So. 
Where's the, where's the third reading? Second one. Good. Where's the third? Thanks. I just wanted to follow on that point. But basically, uh, breaking out of uh, habitual patterns and uh, sort of having to actually check ourselves more frequently because we're not in a boys club and we can't just uh, glad hand and slap each other on the back and we actually have to think about uh, the, the fact that we are in a society when we're not presented with the, the same mirror back face that I see in the mirror every day when I wake up. These two answers I also think are great. But also, uh, if the tech industry is where jobs should go in general, where humanity should go, which I think it is, you can't really accomplish that when approximately half of the world isn't really participating. Just, you can't fill the jobs if half the population doesn't fill the jobs. Yeah, thank you. Mm, I think we have one more. I, as a manager, I want the best talent pool that I can find, right? Half of the population is not in the talent pool, I'm losing out the majority of what can happen. So that's why I think it's important for those who come to the Yeah. Thank you guys. Those are some great answers. Oh, one more. You also Sorry. expand Sorry. your market because women are also teaching the little kids in general and I'm going to enforce that. So you also expand your market. If you have women, you don't want to cater to women. What do you direct your marketing to? directing marketing towards women. You can't do that if you don't have women. Yeah, those are all great points. And there uh, are some, as somebody else mentioned, Karen Caitlin spoke this in this very space a few months ago. And while there are definitely more reasons than this, I'm going to kind of copy off of some of her reasons. Um, so here's a few of the reasons that she provides for why women need to be in the tech. So better problem solving. When women are a part of a team, they, it's more effective at problem solving. This has been proven by an MIT, Carnegie Mellon, and Union College study. Um, better decision making. Diverse teams make better decisions 60% of the time that lead to better business results, according to a Cloverbox study. Better financial performance. A Catalyst study showed that companies with the most number of women in senior, senior leadership positions were financially better off than companies with the least number. And the larger candidate pool. The National Center for Women and in Information Technology reported that there are expected to be 3.5 million computing-related re computing opening, job openings in the U.S. by 2026, and only 17% of these jobs can be filled by U.S. computing bachelor's degree recipients by 2026. So there are a lot of tech jobs open, um, so why not cast the widest possible net? So with these great reasons to get more girls into tech, what are we currently doing to make this happen? Well, as a girl in tech myself, I think sharing my own tech story might provide a little bit of an insight. I've spent my whole life in Kansas City. The farthest I've ever moved is literally across the block. And despite what that picture on the left might lead you to believe, as a child, I wasn't the kid you would ex have expected to go into a STEM career. I liked art, singing, dancing, stuff that you wouldn't necessarily relate to a STEM career. I got into this field Primarily out of luck. Um, my dad worked in IT, and he believed that it was important that I had those skills. So he signed me up for a one-week, girls-only app development camp, where I learned how to combine my love of the arts with computing. And I had such a positive experience at that camp that I went on to do more camps and classes. Despite many times being the only girl in the room, I constantly reminded myself of how fun an initial coding experience was, where I felt safe and listened to. So later, when the opportunity presented itself, I went back and volunteered at those initial camps with the Kansas City STEM Alliance. And then, after a summer of helping them, the Kansas City STEM Alliance offered me the opportunity to meet Malala, the Nobel Peace Prize winner from Pakistan. Malala won her Nobel Peace Prize because she stood up for girls' rights to be educated, and she inspired me to do more in my own community. So I started two Girls Who Code clubs in the Kansas City area. And after that, I continued to have some cool experiences. With the help of Julie Wilson from Cerner, I figured out how to leave school two hours early every day to work an internship here at Cerner. I know, it was the best deal ever. I worked with all those guys in the bottom photo in cybersecurity. And with the help of my friend Aaron Smith, I co-founded KC Seminists, 
which is a group that helps girls not only learn about technology, but about entrepreneurship and global issues. And because of all the work, STEM work I had done in Kansas City, I was able to have some national and international recognition. I was selected as one of 20 girls to attend the YSI Girls STEAM Camp in Malawi, Africa, where I spent three weeks studying under organizations like Google, NASA, Intel, the Department of State, the National Society of Microbiology, and the UN's Grow Up Campaign, among others. I have told my story on the TEDx Youth KC, the TEDx Women KC, and the TEDx Pittsburgh State Stages. I was a 2018 She++ Plus Plus Include Fellow and a National Center for Women in Information Technology Aspirations in Computing National Award winner. And because of all this, I was named as Kansas City's youngest ever 30 under 30. So clearly, there are opportunities available for girls in STEM. And it seems like we should be good, right? With all of this work, shouldn't we be considering ourselves good on that whole girls in tech thing? I'm saying no. Because honestly, from what I've learned from working with these organizations, I don't think organizations alone are going to fix this issue. Organizations for Girls in STEM focus primarily on bringing more girls into the tech pipeline, but not necessarily on retention. Now we need to focus on supporting girls once they are in the tech pipeline, and supporting girls once they are in those male-dominated environments. Because if we don't do that, many of these girls will dip their toe into a tech job, they'll decide it's not a comfortable place to be, and we'll lose them. We put so much attention in these programs on teaching some of the basic tech skills, and that's great. But once girls need to advance onwards in STEM, they will be in classrooms where they are in the minority. And we need to prepare them for, what, for that experience, because it's a challenge to be the only girl in the room. Let me share a couple examples from my own experiences. Just this year, my school started a program called Stream Nights, which stands for Science, Technology, Religion, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. Don't ask me why people keep feeling the need to add more letters to the STEM acronym. I heard the acronym HAMSTER the other day, and I'm never so glad I don't have to keep up with this. But the stream nights are to encourage junior high students to take on engineering projects after school in groups. I attended the first meeting as an observer, and I was disappointed to see that every attendee was male. 20 guys and no girls. However, my hopes returned about 15 minutes later, when two girls walked in late. So now there's one female out of every 11 people in the room, which is pretty good compared to some STEM classrooms. But during that meeting, the, they formed two groups to brainstorm projects, and the two girls were split up. A couple weeks later, the principal of my school approached me. He told me that the two girls had left the stream program. Apparently, one girl felt awkward walking into the classroom late, and then later got frustrated by guys not hearing her ideas. She decided she didn't want to attend anymore, and the other girl decided that because she did not want to be the only girl in the room. He encouraged me to talk about my own story as a way of helping, hoping, helping them to stay in the program. See, that really left me disheartened, because it reminded me of my own experiences. <coughs> I too have walked in late to coding classrooms and felt out of place. I, when I was in the seventh grade, I went through the exact same struggle of feeling like I was being, wasn't, the exact same struggle of not feeling like I was being listened to in a group full of guys. But I was in the seventh grade a little over five years ago. You can't tell me that problem is going away when five years later, girls are still facing the same struggles that I faced. And it reminded me that bringing girls into tech just won't fix this. Now let me give you a different example. Here is a picture of my Girls Who Code Club from last year. The club got smaller as the year went on, but we had a base of members who showed up regularly. Now you might have noticed something about that photo. In our Girls Who Code Club, we had a dude named Isaac. <laughs> See, our club was promoted to girls, but not limited to girls. And Isaac was the perfect example of a male ally. I think Isaac is going to solve our girls in tech issue. Not him per se, but he will be part of the solution. Girls supporting other girls, yes, but also boys supporting girls. Isaac learned how to do that. In those club meetings, we talked about the problems that girls face in tech, and Isaac was there to listen. So that was last year, and this year we have even more guys in our club, but nothing has changed. The guys don't get any more of a say in projects than girls do. Everyone respects each other, and we don't interrupt each other. So to really solve this girls in tech issue, I think we need a couple of things. 
We need a people who are cognizant of the stereotypes and the problems in tech and stand up against them. We need people who are willing to make small, simple changes to their behaviors, whether it's in your computer science classrooms or in your tech meetings. We need to teach our girls in tech to be brave and not perfect. And we need to teach our boys to be kind. So let's talk about a few things that we can all do in our classrooms and our meeting rooms to make this happen. Let's talk about networking, or as us students call it, socializing. Most people tend to form what we call just like me networks. We form relationships based off of having common interests, common hobbies, or similar upbringings. And many of us spend time with our networks outside of work or outside of school. I'm not placing blame here, but this tends to happen pretty naturally. But we need to recognize that this behavior creates a barrier for those people who aren't just like me. People who didn't have similar upbringings or similar interests and hobbies. And if we're not careful, it can limit who we have in leadership positions. But there are some few small, simple changes we can do to fix this. First, think about how you can increase the diversity of your network. Get to know people who aren't just like me. It takes a little bit more effort, but it's not that difficult. Introduce yourself, make conversations, and get to know them. Have lunch with them, connect on social media and LinkedIn. And if you happen to be in a leadership role, think about the people you give stretch assignments to. Since it's those stretch assignments that often lead to a career advancement. Okay, now let's talk about meeting rooms. In the workplace, we have a lot of meetings. And in the classroom, not so much. But we do have group projects and group chats. Let's talk about how we communicate in these spaces, and especially how we should not communicate. There's a term that occasionally gets thrown around called manterruptions. It's when in a group, a male talks over a female and doesn't let her finish her thoughts. And this photo is probably the famous, most famous ever manterruption in history, when Kanye West interrupted Taylor's speech when she was accepting an award because he believed that she knew better about who deserved that award. Another problem that occasionally happens is called bro creations. This is when a male restates a female's idea as if it was his own idea. Next is redirections, which this is when, in a meeting, the male directs his question to another male, when it's clear that the female has, in the room has more expertise. And lastly, there are sexist jokes and sexist comments. They might be funny, and you might think that the female in the room can handle it, but it's unnecessary, and it hurts the work environment if people think that this behavior is okay. Over time, these things can build up, and they really do cause a lot of females to debate whether or not they should stay in tech. So what can we do about these? Again, we're talking about small, simple changes. Try some of these in your next meeting. I like what Cheyenne said, and I think. I'd like to hear Emma finish what she was saying before. Yes, that was the point that Anna made earlier. Maya is the expert, let's ask her. And then think, if you think of a sexist joke or a sexist comment, maybe choose not to say it. Think before you speak. It's a skill we've learned since kindergarten. Next, let's talk about office housework. So what do I mean by this? I mean taking notes, ordering and bringing food, scheduling meetings, and organizing celebrations. Many times, the guys will assume that the female in the group doesn't mind doing these things, but that doesn't make it fair. In fact, when you regularly make the female take notes or organize celebrations, it sends a message to the team that she's not an equal member. Now, if taking notes or scheduling meetings happens to be the female's job, that's perfectly okay. But if it's not, then make this a shared responsibility. Take turns, set up a rotation, and don't let the guys wriggle out of their turns. I don't have good handwriting is not an excuse to get out of it. Everybody has a keyboard nowadays if you're in tech. And if, you're, if somebody's ego is too inflated to do some of this busy work, call it a stretch assignment. So to conclude, I want you to think about something. I'm a little bit of a geek, so I'm a big fan of superheroes. But when we look at the power of superheroes with the use of technology, we're pretty close to achieving a lot of the superhuman feats we see in our favorite comic books. Flying? We can do that. Super strength? Check. Mind reading? Pretty gosh darn close. You might think that you are not a superhero every day when you go into work. I sure don't when I go into my internship. But the knowledge that we have is a superpower. We can control technology. And with that power, we 
have the 100% no joke ability to change the world. And maybe we're even better than the superheroes we see because we can share our power. We can teach others to be superheroes as well. We can pass down our knowledge of technology and the technology that we use. And while we might not have an equal number of male and female superpower superheroes on the screen, we can in real life. And as superheroes, we need to use our power responsibly and our voices responsibly. You've probably heard the quote before, with great power comes great responsibility. We need to help the people in need and speak, act, and make decisions on behalf of the people who don't have this power. Be brave, be kind, and be persistent. In the 1970s, they never believed that a girl could be a doctor. Now, we don't even doubt it, and we don't even think twice about it. Now, today, we need to make sure that no girl doubts again that she can be a computer scientist. And I'd love to see the day when no person ever has to think twice about that either. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions. insurance company and one of the aspects of uh, the diversity and inclusion program at our company was uh, analysis on wage gap data and the CEO recently at a conference they mentioned that it's more of a representation issue at our particular company as opposed to a wage gap issue but because of the representation but the question I have is the statistics are often able to um, speak to bias. If people are anti-women in STEM, they can say, well, this, that, or the other, and they can pull up statistics. Do you have any feedback <laughs> on how we can be better stewards of the data and speak to the, the truth? Okay, yeah. Um, I'm still in statistics class, so I'm not going to be the one creating <laughs> statistics anytime soon. Um, but um, I think kind of what we need to do is we need to make sure that we look at both sides and we fact check ourselves. Just kind of like what we've done with fake news. People have those biases either for or against girls and they'll figure out how to present the data accordingly. So continuing to make sure that we're uh, on both sides, that we fact check ourselves and that we um, continue to make sure that the data that we see is actually accurate. So awesome, thank you guys so much.